that's not going to end well. That dovetail cutter, which is this dovetail cutter, wasn't happy doing its thing on that piece of 4140. And since I burned the only dovetail cutter I had, and waiting 3 weeks to get a new one was out of question, I spent the next 3 weeks making this. Ok, it didn't take me 3 weeks. Surely it took me longer to find this than to make the cutter. I looked everywhere for this box because I knew it had some 60 degrees inserts inside. Which comes in handy since I need to make a 60 degrees dovetail cutter. These TCMT inserts are probably not the best for this, but it's what I have around here and they will have to work. So first thing I'm going to do is cleaning up this a little bit before I spray my chuck with all of this surface truss. And out of these will come a big cutter, one that cuts 20mm dovetails. This thing is not very round, so before anything else, I'm going to center drill for tailstock support and turn a small portion at the end to make it round. Then I flip the part and do the same on the other side, because this is a long piece of stock and needs tailstock support for the turning operations. The shank of the cutter will have 16mm, so I have to turn this down a little bit. I'll be taking 0.5 to 1mm roughing passes and a 0.250 finishing pass. With the shank on dimension, I have to replace the solid tool post mount with the compound. That will allow me to turn the tapered section of the tool. The compound angle will be set with the help of a 30 degrees angle block, reference to the cross slide's front face. I know that runs through to the bad ways. Next, I'll start shaping the taper using my cordless swabbler. And that's the basic shape of the cutter complete. After parting the body with the spring part off tool, I want to face both ends. The problem is, how to hold this part to face the end of the shank? The tapered section is too big to go through the chuck's bore, so I guess if I turn a large collet, I might be able to hold it. Or maybe not, because the taper has the same length as my chuck jaws. Oh, I know, this might just work. That was easier than I expected, I was lucky. Now since I removed the chuck to turn the part around, I'm changing to the 5C. Just because I love changing collets. Alright, that's the lathe work done. From now on, everything will be done with the dividing head. And for that, I've done two things off camera. I modified the back plate to take my forge out chuck and made an aluminum bushing for the shank of the tool. That's just to avoid getting jaw marks. So with the driving mechanism disengaged, I'm proceeding to get the part centered on the forge jaw chuck. Then, I try to make my setup in a few different positions, but it seems I keep reaching the working limits of my mill. Looks like there's only one position that gives me enough travel to do the work. 
and that's with the dividing head partially unsupported and clamped down in one place only. It's not ideal, but we'll see. I'll start with the roughing end mill. Ugh. Did it bend? I don't think it's bent. There's a few marks. Mm, probably will clean up. Let's clamp the dividing head at the back and continue. I should have done that from the start. Ok, different end mill, different strategy. I'm coming from the top now and will be making light passes. What I'm doing here is roughing the pockets for the carbide inserts. But let me explain the idea for this cutter. I want to be able to cut 20mm dovetails, so I'm going to try to squeeze 3 inserts in this tool. One insert per tooth, but not in the conventional way. I'm going to position each insert 50% higher than the previous, so that there's an overlap when cutting. That means all pockets are different. Remember when I marked this line? That was to mark the center of the tool, and I think, normally, that's where the tips of the inserts would be. I mean, on center. However, have a look at this. The TCMT inserts have a clearance angle of 7 degrees. If I place them on center, they have just a little bit of clearance. By the time the tool makes the first few cuts, the trailing edge will start rubbing on the workpiece. But, on the other hand, if I place the inserts above center, let's say by half of their thickness, things get better. I know I could tilt them to get some axial rake, which should probably be compensated with radial rake, but I want to keep this simple. These will be set at 0 degrees and 1.2 millimeters above center. And this is the cut that sets the final depth in all pockets. Now it's time to fit the inserts. I want to have them registered in their pockets to prevent any chance of side movement. As for stick out, I'll leave the trailing edges just slightly exposed. I don't want to compromise insert support, but I also don't want the tool rubbing while cutting. And it looks like the first one is too far out, so I'll make a couple of light cuts until it fits nicely. After that, I'll drill and tap the first M2.5 hole. To set the quill in the correct position for that, I made this alignment tool on the lathe. This is just something made to be a snug fit for the insert while having some clearance for the cutter. So now I can move the table and push the insert to the final position. I should mention I'm doing this by feeling. Then, I remove the tool and move the table an additional 500 of a millimeter. This is to ensure proper registration. At this point, I must remember the bottom has to be faced again, so I have to allow some room for that. With the table set and locked, now I just need to move the quill until the tapping is complete. Speaking of which, the tap size minus the pitch should give me the drill size. In this case, 2.5 minus 0.45 means I need a 2.05 drill, which I don't have. I do have a 2.1. I think that should give me around 65-70% to 70 thread engagement, so I'll be using that. And as for tapping, this time I'll be using a 3-tap set. I don't want to go down the same road as in the previous video. The first one went well, two more to go. These need to be positioned even more carefully than the first one. A slight misalignment between two inserts means the tool will leave a ridge in the cut where both inserts meet. So with the dividing head still locked, I bring in my DTI and zero it at a common point for both inserts. Then I move to the next pocket and lock the dividing head again. The second insert will find its position when the DTI reads zero. But just in case, I'll do this process a couple of times to make sure the DTI repeats. And then, I'll drill and tap the second hole. Two down, one to go. Rinse and repeat. And here it is! Can you believe I didn't even break a tap on this? Even the drill survived, and that one was clearly bent. Actually, 
let me tell you a secret. I got carried away and made another one. I don't even know why. I just thought, why not? It might be useful one day. And one of these is so much easier to make. No need for the dividing head, the four jaw chuck, or even to align inserts. But I'm sure you want to see this in action. So bear with me. There's something else you don't know. I have a D-bit grinder. Well, now you do. I've been thinking and I'd like to save the HSS cutter. I've been using this grinder to make simple cutters, but to be honest, most of the time I don't know what I'm doing. Even so, before throwing this away, why not give it a shot? I think I can get away with just resharpening the cutting edges and leaving the reliefs alone. And I'm going to start with the bottom ones. The problem with this cutter is that it has 10 teeth, and I don't know if it's me doing something wrong, but it's been difficult to find a position where I can grind just one single tooth without ruining the others. After some time, and adapting this diamond wheel I had for another project, I figured out a way. Now that I look at it, I could have done just the same with the aluminum oxide wheel. I guess I was too deep in the rabbit hole to realize that at the time. This position produces a curved cutting edge, but given the width, I don't think it matters much. Now let's focus on the side edges. This is a 60 degrees cutter, that's an included angle. It means I need to set these in the machine at minus 30 degrees. To make that happen, there's a little trick we can do. This joint only swivels from 0 to 90, but if I pull this pin, I can go past 0. So all I need to do is position these at 0, and move the scale to 30. Then I pull the pin and move it to 0, that's actually minus 30 degrees. The rest of the setup is pretty easy. I'm only going to change to the aluminum oxide wheel before I start grinding the tool. That's the proper wheel to grind HSS. It's done, and I only wasted 5 hours on this. Hey, this might not be worth it, but I actually learned some things by doing this. For instance, did you know the dividing plate on a grinder like this has 24 divisions? And that two of them are reserved for the stops that limit the rotation to 180 degrees? That's all interesting, but let me show you why this is a problem and maybe give you the explanation why these are made with that many divisions from the factory. So 24 divisions mean a division every 15 degrees. And we might need to index a cutter with 2, 3, 4 or even more flutes. Let's consider these as non-usable divisions since they have the stop pins pressed in. For the 2 flute cutter, we would use the divisions at 0 and 180 degrees. For the 3 flute, 0, 120 and 240. 4 flutes, 0, 90, 180 and 270. The problem is on the 5th. If we divide 360 by 5, we get 72, and there are no divisions for that. So now go to 5 flute cutters. Next we have 6. I'm not going to bother with 7, but it faces the same issue as the 5 flute cutter. 8 will work, although we need to shift our divisions to make sure we don't fall in one of the stop pins. And then there's the 10 flute cutters, like the one I just resharpened. In case you haven't done the math already, this machine doesn't support that. So how the hell did I just... I was going to make a new dividing plate in steel with 10 divisions. But then, I realized I could simply 3D print an adapter. By the way, that also covers 5 flute cutters. I mean, how many times am I going to need this? A plastic adapter is fine. And that's probably the reason why the factory dividing head has 15 degree divisions. It covers the majority of the cases, if not all one will ever need. And that takes us to the moment you've been waiting for. Let's give this a spin. No! 
I mean, a proper spin. Oh, before I forget, and I wasn't counting on these, given the screws are smaller than the insert holes, there's a little room to adjust them. That's just a tiny bit, up and down, but enough to make a difference. Looking on the bright side, I can tweak them if I want to. But not today. This time I just slapped them on the tool with no concerns whatsoever. So let's see how bad it is with 1000 of an inch of total runout. It cuts, and I can't feel a thing. Actually, I could say I want to feel the ridge between the first and second inserts, but I'm not sure. All in all, it's not too bad, I think. I also don't see any marks or anything wrong on the tool, so I guess I'm going to use it and finish the ball turner I've been working on. What do you think? 